Hello. There we go. That's it. We thank God for the technicians that know how to work these things. Right, Pastor Bowie? That's right. That's right. Here we go. Well, good morning once again. Uh, my name is uh, now Dr. Angel Hassa Gallardo, and it is my pleasure to uh, be with you here this morning on this Higher Education Sunday. You know, I, um, I officiated a wedding yesterday um, for one of my former mentees, and um, it was wonderful. It was wonderful. Um, but then I had to wake up at, you know, about 5.30 this morning to, uh, to be here. And, uh, and this is my, actually my first time at the 8 o'clock service. So, so my respect for Pastor Bowie and all the ministers that have to be here week in and week out, you know, just my respects. So thank you. And, and, and of course, you know, waking up was, was actually quite easier with, with this wonderful men's choir right here. They, they put us on point. Some, some gratitude for that. And um, before we get started, I wanted to also take the opportunity to acknowledge some special people in the house. Uh, Pastor Bowie already beat me to it and, and asked my, my, my lovely wife to stand up so you know who she is. But I'm, I'm grateful for her and for all her love and support. And indeed, we are excited um, for our addition, um, who, um, Carolina Mercedes, who will be here with us in October, God willing. Um, I want to also ask all of the graduates to stand. I don't think we did that yet, did we? No. All right. So all of the graduates, whether it's junior high, high school, law school, medical school, um, everyone, please stand and remain standing so we can acknowledge you. Wonderful. Yeah. We are very, very proud. And, and, and particularly for me, it's, it's wonderful to see, um, actually, uh, one, of my, one of my mentees, um, an SMU alum, and now a UNT law alum, Mikey Solares, who, um, who is here with his father and his uh, classmate. So, a native of Dallas, and, uh, and his father, an attorney as well, it's, it's um, Mr. Solares, so it's, it's good to have you um, all here with us today. Well, would you please stand with me as we read the word of the Lord. Our reading today comes from Acts chapter 2, verses 41 to 52. Acts chapter 2, 41 through 52. Sorry, did I say Acts? Ah, I'm just making sure you're listening to me. I was talking about Luke. Here we go, Luke. That's, I got Luke. Yeah. Well, you know, it's actually, according to the biblical scholars, it's all one book. Right? It's Luke Acts. So technically, I was right. There we go. We thank God for God's grace. Amen? Amen. All right, so here now a reading from the Gospel of Luke. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the feast of the Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up according to custom. And when the feast was ended... As they were returning, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem. His parents did not know it, but supposing him to be in the group, they went a day's journey, but then they began to search for him among their relatives and acquaintances. When they did not find him, they returned to Jerusalem, searching for him. After three days, they found him in the temple, 
sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. All who heard him were amazed at his understanding and his answers. And when his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us so? Behold, your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. And he said to them, Why were you looking for me? Did you not know that I must be in my father's house? And they did not understand the sayings he spoke to them. And he went down with them and came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured up all these things in her heart. And Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. The word of the Lord. You may be seated. Let us pray. Holy and gracious God, we love you and we give you thanks. We invite you into this space. Come before us. Speak through me and in spite of me so that the thoughts of our hearts and the meditations of our minds may be acceptable in your sight, our Lord and our Redeemer. Amen. I would like to offer up the topic Learning to teach under the shadow of empire. Learning to teach under the shadow of empire. Now, you may no notice already that the New Testament hardly includes any accounts of Jesus during his childhood or adolescence. By most accounts, the Gospels include a birth narrative, if that. And then all of a sudden, Jesus is a grown adult, 30 years of age, preaching and teaching and traveling through Judea and Galilee. But we don't get to see Jesus' formation, at least not a full picture. And then on this, on this graduation Sunday, I wanted to take the opportunity to focus on this text precisely because it gives us a glimpse, perhaps the only glimpse, of Jesus' own education, of his own graduation of sorts. In our reading, we heard how 12-year-old Jesus decided to stay behind in the temple without his parents' approval. Biblical scholars believe that Luke includes this story to emphasize the necessity of God-made flesh in Jesus Christ. As we will see, the Gospel of Luke is thoroughly shaped by a theology of the Incarnation, and I want to focus on the story in order to explore the ways in which a young Jesus learned. In doing so, I hope to outline some key implications of his example as we recognize our recent graduates on this Higher Education Sunday. So the text says that Mary and Joseph and Jesus traveled to Jerusalem every year as was their custom. Every year, they gathered their things and walked for 64 miles. Now, anyone who has traveled with children will tell you that it is no small feat. A long road trip a long road trip will test every ounce of patience in your body. Will question, will make you question every virtue that you thought you had. 
You see, uh, growing up, I spent many summers going to Mexico City to visit extended family. And on uh, one, one year when I was in, in high school, I remember one return flight in particular. I recall sit, sitting next to a, a young woman, a mother of modest means named Lucy and her two-year-old son, Miguel. Now, Lucy was, was on point. She had her makeup done. She had a matching outfit, glossy nails, a new hairdo. I imagine she was feeling pretty good. But of course, this was before the plane took off. <laughs> During the flight, Miguel did everything his body would permit. <laughs> Screamed, he cried, he complained about the snacks, he kicked the seat in front of him, and he made a mess in his diaper a couple times. And so, you know, this ordeal lasted for the entirety of the flight, which was a little over two hours. And if I'm honest, I kind of felt like giving him a solid pinch. <laughs> and, the, and the poor woman apologized a number of times to all of those who, who surrounded her. And, and, you know, she acknowledged that we got no rest. She tried everything she, she could to control her son. And ultimately, she failed. When we landed... Right before all the passengers deplaned, Miguel fell asleep. <laughs> he was knocked out cold, ice cold. Meanwhile, Lucy looked exhausted. Her hair was all messed up, mascara runny, food stains on her fancy clothes. She was a wreck. Some may even say she looked like a Hurricane Katrina survivor. But nevertheless, she held on to Miguel. Now, before parting ways, I asked Lucy, what took you to Mexico? And I will never forget her response. She said, well, the truth is, I was undocumented for a long time. This man couldn't leave the U.S. without risking being removed permanently from my husband and my, my kids. And as a result, I didn't see my parents for over 15 years. But I recently obtained legal status and decided to take my youngest son, Miguel, to meet his grandparents, to meet the place of my birth. I wanted him to know where he came from. And so it hit me, years later, that this mother went through all that trouble so that Miguel could know his family, so that he could connect with his roots. And I think in our text today, Mary and Joseph did something similar. Every spring, they packed their bags, and with the little money they had in their pockets, they departed on foot. The journey from Nazareth to Jerusalem lasted several days, and they went there to celebrate the feast of the Passover. Now, for those who, who may be unfamiliar with this holiday, it is the holiday in which the Jews remember how God liberated them from Egypt, how he liberated them from slavery. Passover was an essential part of their heritage because it reminded the people of God's solidarity with them, specifically with the oppressed. The God of Israel intervenes on behalf of the exploited, and they remember this every year. So traveling to Jerusalem for 12 consecutive years, I imagine, must have shaped Jesus' identity, his calling, Celebrating the Passover under imperial duress must have provided hope for a better future. Now, what do I mean by imperial duress? Well, 
although we may not think about it on a regular basis, the entire New Testament is a text written under imperial domination. Every book of the New Testament. The Jews, the early Christians, the followers of Jesus, and the Gentiles who joined that community lived under the thumb of the Roman Empire. At the time, it was the mightiest force the world had ever seen. And so, traveling from Galilee to Jerusalem was an essential part for Jesus. It signaled, I think, a sign for a better future. The fact that God had defeated Egypt, and if God had done that, God may also do that with the Romans. The next point I want to highlight is something that may be surprising. And that is that Jesus learns to submit. You see, after the celebrations were over, Mary and Joseph started their way back to Galilee. But Jesus, unbeknownst to them, stayed behind. And his family had traveled with a caravan, a large group of people, of family and friends who were from that region. And... Mary and Joseph assumed that Jesus was among the crowd, that he was part of the caravan, but somewhere behind or up ahead. Now, you may be wondering, how is it that Mary and Joseph lost track of Jesus for an entire day? You know, that's, were they bad parents? No, I'm not suggesting they are. You know, we all know how family reunions get, how big parties at the park, big barbecues with, with our friends and, and, uh, and our colleagues and our neighbors, when the cousins get together, you know. I could, when, I did, when, you know when I did that as, as a kid growing up, I could be out playing with my, you know, with my cousins you know, in the street for hours with my family, you know. My, my, my parents were, were doing their own thing, but it wasn't because they didn't care. They knew that as long as I was with my kind, I would be taken care of. They knew that the older cousins would take care of the younger cousins. They knew that, you know, if I stepped out of line, aunties and, and uncles, and they would, they would set me straight. You know, they even gave permission to some of the neighbors to, you know, pull my ears and... Yank me to the house, you know, if I needed uh, to explain something. You know, I imagine I'm the only one that, uh, that had that type of experience. The village had permission to check me if need be, is what I'm trying to say. And you see, likewise, Mary and Joseph trusted their community. They trusted their people with their son who, by the way, was 12, going on 13, which meant that he was on the threshold of adulthood. He was about to become what was considered a young man in this society. But after a while, they stopped and began asking, has anyone seen Jesus? Have you seen him? About this high? You know, scraggly hair, maybe got a ponytail like this, you know. But after not finding him, I imagine they got worried pretty quickly. Can you imagine what they were thinking? What if he was separated from the group? What if he was attacked by a wild animal? Or worse, what if he was harassed by these Roman soldiers? His life may be in danger. We have to do something, Mary may have thought. In the end, they spent four days searching for him, and fear and anxiety increased with every passing moment. Now, 
as I mentioned, this is a context of imperial duress. Israel was under Roman occupation, which meant that the Jews were colonized subjects in their own land. Israel's territory was colonial space. Roman soldiers patrolled the streets with the pretense of maintaining law and order. But the reality was quite different. We know how empires treat their subjects. We know how imperial agents use psychological warfare and economic coercion to enforce their will on other people. You see, agents of empire assert their dominance through sexual and physical violence. Like Trayvon Martin and Pedro Villanueva, an arm, unarmed Latino killed in California by the police, Jesus lived under the constant threat of state-sanctioned violence. And in due time, he would indeed suffer the full weight of the Roman Empire in the form of a cross. Now, the Gospel doesn't say why Jesus did not inform his parents that he planned to stay in Jerusalem. Perhaps, like teenagers of every generation, he thought he knew better. Maybe he thought he didn't have to ask for permission. Now, it's not like he was doing anything inappropriate. After all, he was in the house of God. But Luke includes an important deal, uh, detail towards the end of this passage. In verse 51, it reads, And he went down with them after everything ended, and he came to Nazareth and was submissive to them. And his mother treasured all these things in her heart. So, you heard rightly. Jesus, the word of God, willingly submits to his parents to mere human beings. And we should not overlook this factor because it reveals a crucial aspect of the incarnation. According to Luke, Jesus' submission is a marker of wisdom because it signifies maturity. But I want to suggest something else. Submission is not just a sign, it also is the means through which Jesus lives into his calling. In particular, this lesson may apply to our high school and perhaps even our college graduates. Now, you may think that a curfew is unfair. You may find a, a phone call from, from your folks when you're out with your friends to be annoying or unnecessary. I know I did. You may be thinking, I can take care of myself. Besides, what's the worst that can happen? Perhaps they're just being paranoid. Perhaps your parents are just being extra. But keep in mind that God has entrusted your parents and your church family with your well-being. As a Christian community, we are charged to look out for one another, especially those who are vulnerable, whether they know it or not. We, may, we, we are called to look out for those who may not be given the benefit of the doubt, especially by those in power. Healthy boundaries are not meant to stifle you. They are meant to help you thrive. Moreover, this charge also extends to you. You are, are young graduates, although some may say I, I should count myself among, among the crowd. I'm afraid I can't. Uh, but this extends to you as well. You must take ownership of your own well-being. This means being wise with how you spend your time, with what you consume, with who you spend time with, who you date, which desires you indulge, and what professional ambitions you pursue. After all, we are called to glorify God in all things. Amen. 
as disciples of Christ, all of us, young and not so young, how does my life reflect the way of the cross? Mary and Joseph also confronted this question and to see how we must explore what occurred in the temple a bit further. Returning to the text, Luke says that Mary and Joseph retraced their steps all the way back to Jerusalem. And what was Jesus doing? Apparently, when they found him, he was in the synagogue, and they were astonished, but not in a good way. Mary and Joseph were upset, and I can understand why. Mary said, Son, why have you treated us so? Your father and I have been searching for you in great distress. You see, I took the time to analyze this verse. I looked at the Greek. I studied the etymology, and I came up with even a better translation. And it goes something like this. Son, how are you going to do us like that? <laughs> do you know the H-E-L-L -L you put us through? You see, that's what a good theological education will do. It'll let you get into the text like that. You see, like a typical teenager, Jesus seemed to have a bit of an attitude. If you don't agree, look at how he responds. He says, why were you looking for me? Mind your business. Didn't you know I would be in my father's house? This sounds like a snarky comeback. Jesus is basically saying, Mom, why are you tripping? If you're stressed out, that's, your, that's on you. Besides, Joseph ain't my daddy. Why do I got to listen to him? You know, in my sanctified imagination, I can see Mary saying, Boy, if you don't get your narrow behind on that donkey right now. You bet you just wait till we get home. In fact, go get me one of those switches off of the uh, olive tree while you're at it. Teach you some manners. Now, the text does not specify what, if any, was Jesus' punishment. But his response poses a stark contrast between two fathers. His earthly father, Joseph, and his heavenly father. God. In doing so, Jesus reminds Mary and Joseph of a harsh truth. The will of God is more important than yours. Now, this may be a hard reality for many parents and elders and caretakers to accept. You may want your daughter, your son, your grandson, your granddaughter, to pursue a certain way of life, a certain type of career, a certain mindset, a certain spouse. But Jesus reminds his parents, and by extension all parents, that children are not their property. Jesus reminds them that children ultimately belong to God, the creator of heaven and earth. You see, earthly parents, whether adoptive or biological, are simply called to be faithful stewards. Now, you know, we're expecting, so at this point I'm just preaching for myself. But rather than simply telling our young people exactly what to do, I think that we should empower them to discern the will of God for themselves. We should empower them to figure out the best way to build God's kingdom of justice and peace here on earth. We must first, however, lead by example. I think by doing so, we may enable them to follow the Spirit wherever the Spirit may lead even if it's in a direction that we did not anticipate nor fully agree with. 
You see, this adds a whole new dimension to the line of the Lord's Prayer. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And so, graduates, I'm here to tell you that Christian discipleship may require you to make some hard decisions. You may have to choose between what people expect from you and what God wants from you. You may find yourself at a crossroads and find yourself asking, do I continue down this path of convenience or do I pursue what God desires for me, even if it hurts? If you are scared and doubtful, rest assured that you're in good company because Jesus himself faced this turmoil. Throughout his life, a whole host of people had their own agendas for him. You remember Mary, his mother, the one who said, Lord, be it unto me according to your will, when she was a teenager. When Jesus started doing miracles and and going out into the community, and she went out and and said, hey, go call Jesus. You know, go through the crowd, somebody, and call my son Jesus and tell him his mom is looking for him. I got some, some to tell him. And someone went and told Jesus, what did he say? Who's my mother? Who's my father? Only those that are doing the will of God. You remember Peter? When Jesus said that he, uh, that when Jesus told him, I must be crucified in order to fulfill the prophecies. What did Peter say? Let that not be the case. And he pulled out, he said, you know, I'm going to cut him first. Pulled out his sword. And what did Jesus respond? Get thee behind me, Satan. All kinds of people had agendas for Jesus. But his goal was to focus on what God wanted for him and to pursue that faithfully. Recall his passion supplication in the Garden of Gethsemane? Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me. Yet, not my will be done, but yours. Because of the incarnation, we can be confident that God in Christ understands our dilemma. By taking on flesh, God has gone gone before us to fight our battles. In In Christ, God has faced our fears. You see, in Christ, God has wrestled with our temptations. You see, in Christ, God, on the cross and in the resurrection, has been victorious. Through death, Christ has conquered death. And there's one final lesson I want to emphasize. And this requires us to revisit the temple once again. I want to highlight how Jesus learns from his elders. Jesus learns from his elders. When Mary and Joseph returned to the temple, they found him sitting with the doctors of the law, some translations say. And what was he doing? Listening and asking questions. That's right. He stayed behind in order to study with the learned women and men of his day. Now, these were the scholars, the theologians, you know, who had spent years memorizing Scripture, internalizing Israel's story, debating the ancient prophecies, discussing the Psalms. You know, the nerdy ones with the funky glasses and ponytails that just spend all day in the library. If Jesus were here today, he may have stayed at Perkins, you know, a couple days while his parents headed back to the Rio Grande Valley. You know, there he may have studied womanist and mujerista theology with Karen Baker Fletcher. If he were there, he may have studied the New Testament with Abraham Smith. If he were there, he may have studied pastoral counseling with Paula Dobbs Wiggins and and Christian ethics with Theodore Walker and practical theology with Evelyn Parker. What I'm trying to say is that we have elders in our midst from which our young people can glean and draw on. 
You see, Jesus didn't have to go to Rome or to Athens or to Alexandria or Cappadocia or Persia to learn. He did it with his own people. He turned to the learned ones from his own community. Now, Luke concludes the story with a controversial notion in verse 52. It reads, Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. The phrase increased in stature can also be translated as coming into maturity. It signifies progression, an expansion of knowledge that is indicative of the creaturely condition of the human experience. And I mention this because we must not lose sight of Jesus' disposition and its theological implications for us today. Notice how Jesus does not show up on the scene with all the answers figured out. He doesn't sit on high and proclaim divine truths. He listens. He asks. Before ever taking foot, stepping foot on the mount to, uh, to give his first sermon, he had to learn. Rather than declaring truth from on high, Jesus chose to listen. And you may be wondering, wait a minute, but if God is all-knowing and Jesus had to learn, then how could you, Jesus be fully God? That's a contradiction. How could Jesus grow in knowledge and still be divine? Well, if you're asking that, I'm glad you asked. <laughs> you see, these questions, I want to suggest, misunderstand the way Christians come to know God. The incarnation, our quintessential doctrine, means that in Jesus, God shares in the shape of the creature. As theologian Willie Jennings points out, Jesus learns the wisdom of his people, their way with the earth, with the land, with the animals. He works with his hands. He works with the land. And this crucial reality has always been difficult for Christians to remember because we have turned the idea of an all-knowing God against the God we know in Jesus. God does know. And in Christ, God has chosen to learn with us. And so rather than starting with preconceived notions of divinity, our understanding of divinity itself should begin with the God we see revealed in Jesus of Nazareth. Now, before I take my seat, I want to make one final point regarding how the doctors engaged Jesus, how the elders of his community directed themselves at him. Now, according to Luke, all who heard him were amazed at his understanding, at his answers. The fact that Jesus was answering questions implies that somebody was asking questions. You see, they took a young boy, not even a teenager, they took the time to sit with him for four days. They took him seriously. They wanted to hear what he had to say. This insight made me wonder whether St. Luke is doing all it can to learn from the youth. How seriously are we addressing their needs, their interests, their concerns? And lastly, the fact that the audience was amazed with his answers made me wonder one other thing. I wonder if there were some in the temple that were surprised at his responses because they had really low expectations. Remember, Jesus was from Galilee. This was a region considered to be culturally inferior. 
economically subordinate, especially by the social elites in Jerusalem. It would be like someone from rural Mississippi stepping up to Wall Street and trying to engage with, 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 uh, with the bankers and the, and the politicians on a one-to-one uh, level. You see, Jesus came from a poor family. He was a carpenter, like Joseph. He worked with his hands. His status was like that of a day laborer. In fact, years later, when Jesus began his ministry, do you remember? People started asking, isn't this the Galilean? Right? Isn't it, wait a minute, how is it that he can speak with all this authority and, tr- and, 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 and confidence and that he knows his stuff? Isn't this Mary's baby? Right? I thought nothing good can come from Nazareth. Sadly, today, teachers, employers, law enforcement representatives, public officials continue to see people of color in a similar way. Believe it or not, that was the case with me. In high school, teachers began telling my parents and me that I simply wasn't college material. And so they placed me, like hundreds of other uh, Latino classmates of mine, in what were called B-track courses. The bare minimum, the basics to get us through, but not prepare us to pursue any further education. You see, as an undocumented immigrant from Mexico, my options were already limited. Needless to say that I became frustrated and hopeless. In fact, I ended up failing so many classes in high school that I didn't even graduate on time. But fortunately, we serve a God who does not forget, who steps in when we need God the most, who stands in the gap for those that cannot help themselves. You see, God sent mentors my way. He sent people from our church community, from my family, youth pastors and mentors and and, and neighbors, and eventually professors to encourage me, to guide me. And you know what? They saw beyond the lies of the world. They saw what God saw. Something worthwhile. You see, they helped me realize who I was in Christ. And by doing so, I was able to envision who I could become. And so I stand before you as a living testimony of God's power. And I want to let everyone know that this is an invitation to Christians and non-Christians alike. Because far too often, we let the voices in our head and the voices in the world and the powers and principalities, the empires that dictate the order of things, to affect and determine what we believe about ourselves. And Jesus, Jesus says, hold up, wait a minute. Uh Uh-uh. I'm the word that created. I'm the one who brought this person into being. And I will have the final say. Thanks be to God.